presenting Mulliner's Buck You up by P.G. Woodhouse. Society had been giving a performance of Gilbert and Sullivan's Saucerer in aid of the church organ fund. And as we sat in the window of the Angler's Rest smoking our pipes, the audience came, streaming past us down the little street. Snatches of song floated to our ears and Mr. Mulliner began to croon in unison. Ah, me, I was a pale young curate then, <laughs> chanted Mr. Mulliner in the rather snuffling voice in which the amateur singer seems to find it necessary to render the old songs. Remarkable how fashions change, even in clergymen. There are very few pale young curates nowadays. True, true, true. Most of them are beefy young fellows who rode for their colleges. I don't believe I have ever seen a pale young curate. You never met my nephew Augustine, I think. Never. The description in the song would have fitted him perfectly. You will want to hear all about my nephew Augustine. At the time of which I am speaking, Augustine was a curate, a very young and extremely pale. As a boy, he had completely outgrown his strength and I rather think that at his theological college, some of the wilder spirits must have bullied him. For when he went to Lower Brisket in the Midden to assist the vicar, the Reverend Stanley Brandon, in his cure of souls, he was as meek and as mild a young man as you could ever meet in a day's journey. He had dark hair, weak blue eyes, and the general demeanor of a saintly but timid codfish. <laughs> Precisely in short, the sort of young curate who seems to have been so common in the 80s, or whenever it was that Gilbert and Sullivan wrote The Sorcerer. The personality of his immediate superior did little or nothing to help him to overcome his native diffidence. The Reverend Stanley Brandon was a huge and sinewy man, his violent <laughs> temper, whose red face and glittering eyes might well have intimidated the toughest curate. The Reverend Stanley had been a heavyweight boxer at Cambridge, and I gather from Augustine that he seemed to be always on the point of introducing into debates on parish matters the methods which had made him so successful in the roped ring. I remember Augustine telling me that once, on the occasion when he had ventured to oppose the other's views in the matter of decorating the church for the Harvest Festival, he thought for a moment that the vicar was going to drop him with a right hook to the chin. It was some quite trivial point that had come up, a question as to whether the pumpkin would look better on the apse or the clerestory, if I re recollect rightly. But for several seconds, it seemed as if blood was about to be shed. Such was the Reverend Stanley Brandon. And yet, it was to the daughter of this formidable man that Augustine Mulliner had permitted himself to lose his heart. <laughs> Truly. Cupid makes heroes of us all. <laughs> Jane was a very nice girl and as fond of Augustine as he was of her. But as each lacked the nerve to go to the girl's father and put him abreast of the position of affairs, they were forced to meet surreptitiously. This jarred upon Augustine, who like all the Mulliners, loved the truth <laughs> and hated any form of deception. And one evening, as they paced beside the laurels at the bottom of the vicarage garden, he rebelled. My dearest, I can no longer brook this secrecy. I shall go into the house immediately and ask your father for your hand. Jane no. pale no. and clung to his arm. She knew so well that it was not her hand, but her father's foot 
which he would receive if he carried out this mad scheme. No, Augustine, no. You must not. But, darling, it is the only straightforward course. But not tonight. I beg of you, not tonight. Why not? Because Father is in a very bad temper. He has just had a letter from the bishop rebuking him for wearing too many orphreys on his chasuble, and it has upset him terribly. You see, he and the bishop were at school together, and Father can never forget it. He said at dinner that if old Bucko Bickerton thought he was going to order him about, he would jolly well show him. And the bishop comes here tomorrow for the confirmation services. Yes, and I'm afraid they will quarrel. It's such a pity Father hasn't some other bishop over him. He always remembers that he once hit this one in the eye for pouring ink on his collar, and this lowers his respect for his spiritual authority. <laughs> so you won't go in and tell him tonight, will you? I will not. Augustine assured her with a slight shiver. And you will be sure to put your feet in hot mustard and water when you get home. The dew has made the grass very wet. I will indeed, dearest. You are not strong, you know. No, I am not strong. You ought to take some really good tonic. Perhaps I ought. Good night, Jane. Good night, Augustine. <laughs> The lovers parted. <laughs> James slipped back into the vicarage, and Augustine made his way to his cozy rooms in the high street. And the first thing he noticed on entering was a parcel on the table, and beside it, a letter. He opened it listlessly, his thoughts far away. My dear Augustine, he turned to the last page and glanced at the signature. The letter was from his Aunt Angela, the wife of my brother, Wilfred Molyneux. Wilfred was the eminent chemical researcher who had invented, among other specifics, such world-famous preparations as Molyneux's Rave and Gypsy face cream and the Molyneux Snow of the Mountains lotion. He and Augustine had never been particularly intimate but between Augustine and his aunt, there had always been a warm friendship. My dear Augustine, wrote Angela Mulliner, I have been thinking so much about you lately, and I cannot forget that when I saw you last, you seemed very fragile and deficient in vitamins. <laughs> I do hope you take care of yourself. I have been feeling for some time that you ought to take a tonic, and by a lucky chance, Wilfred has just invented one, which he tells me is the finest thing he has ever done. It's called Buck You Upple, and acts directly on the red corpuscles. It is not yet on the market, but I have managed to smuggle a sample bottle from Wilfred's laboratory, and I want you to try it at once. I am sure it's just what you need. Your affectionate aunt, Angela Molina. P.S. You take a tablespoonful before going to bed and another just before breakfast. <laughs> Augustine was not an unduly superstitious young man, but the coincidence of this tonic arriving so soon after Jane had told him that a tonic was what he needed affected him deeply. It seemed to him that this thing must have been meant. He shook the bottle uncorked it, and pouring out a liberal tablespoonful, shut his eyes and swallowed it. The medicine, he was glad to find, was not unpleasant to the taste. It had a slightly pungent flavor, rather like old boot soles beaten up in sherry. <laughs> Having taken the dose, he read for a while in a book of theological essays, and then went to bed. And as his feet slipped between the sheets, he was annoyed to find that Mrs. Wardle, his housekeeper, had once more forgotten his hot water bottle. Oh, dash! He was thoroughly upset. He told the woman over and over again that he suffered from cold feet and could not get to sleep unless the old dogs were properly warmed up. 
he sprang out of bed and went to the head of the stairs. Mrs. Wardle! There was no reply. Mrs. Wardle! bellowed Augustine in a voice that rattled the window panes like a strong nor'easter. Until tonight, he had always been very much afraid of his housekeeper and had both walked and talked softly in her presence. But now, he was conscious of a strange new fortitude. His head was singing a little, <laughs> and he felt equal to a dozen Mrs. Wardles. <laughs> Shuffling footsteps made themselves heard. <laughs> well, what is it now? <clears throat> Augustine snorted. I'll tell you what it is now. How many times have I told you always to put a hot water bottle in my bed? You've forgotten it again, you old cloth head. <laughs> Mrs. Wardle peered up, astounded and militant. Mr. Mulliner, I am not a to Oh, thundered Augustine. What I want from you is less back chat and more hot water bottles. Bring it up at once, or I leave tomorrow. Let me endeavor to get it into your concrete skull that you aren't the only person letting rooms in this village. Any more lip? And I walk straight round the corner where I'll be appreciated. Hot water bottle hole and look slippy about it. Yes, Mr. Mulliner, certainly, Mr. Mulliner. In one moment, Mr. Mulliner. Action, action, show some speed. Put a little snap into it. <laughs> yes, decidedly, Mr. Mulliner, replied the chastened <laughs> voice from below. An hour later, as he was dropping off to sleep, a thought crept into Augustine's mind. Had he not been a little brusque with Mrs. Wardle? <laughs> Had there not been in his manner something a shade abrupt, almost rude? Yes, he decided regretfully, there had. He lit a candle and reached for the diary which lay on the table at his bedside. He made an entry. The meek shall inherit the earth. <laughs> Am I sufficiently meek? I wonder. This evening, when reproaching Mrs. Wardle, my worthy housekeeper, for omitting to place a hot water bottle in my bed, I spoke quite crossly. Of course, he could scarcely believe that it was he who had written it. No. No. Of course. Wouldn't anybody be quite cross who was forever being persecuted by Beetlewits who forgot hot water bottles? <laughs> Erasing the words with one strong no, no, dash no, no, no. of a thick leaded pencil, Wait a minute. he scribbled in the margin a hasty <laughs> mashed potatoes, served the old idiot right, and went down to breakfast. He felt most amazingly fit. Unada undoubtedly, in asserting that this tonic of his acted forcefully upon the red corpuscles, his Uncle Wilfred had been right. Until that moment, Augustine had never supposed that he had any red corpuscles. <laughs> but now, as he sat waiting for Mrs. Wartle to bring his fried egg, he could feel them dancing about all over him. They seemed to be forming rowdy parties and sliding down his spine. His eyes sparkled, and from sheer joy of living, he sang a few bars from the hymn for those of riper years at sea. He was still singing when Mrs. Wartle entered with a dish. What's this? demanded Augustine, eyeing it dangerously. A nice fried egg, sir. And what, pray, do you mean by nice? It may be an amiable egg. It may be a civil, well-meaning egg. But if you think it is fit for human consumption, adjust that impression. Go back to your kitchen, woman. Select another. And remember, this time, you are a cook, not an incinerating machine. <laughs> Between an egg that is fried and an egg that is cremated, there is a wide and substantial difference. This difference, if you wish to retain me as a lodger in these far too expensive rooms, you will endeavor to appreciate. <coughs> the glowing sense of well-being with which Augustine had begun the day did not diminish with the passage of time. It seemed, indeed, to increase. 
So full of effervescing energy did the young man feel that, departing from his usual custom of spending the morning crouched over the fire, he picked up his hat, stuck it at a rakish angle on his head, and sallied out for a healthy tramp across the fields. It was while he was returning, flushed and rosy, that he observed a sight which is rare in the country districts of England, the spectacle of a bishop running. It is not often in a place like Lower Brisket in the Midden that you see a bishop at all. And when you do, he is either riding in a stately car or pacing at a dignified walk. This one was sprinting like a derby runner. And Augustine paused to drink in the sight. The bishop was a large, burly bishop built for endurance rather than speed. <laughs> but he was making excellent going. He flashed past Augustine in a whirl of flying gators and improving himself thereby no mere specialist, but a versatile all-around athlete, suddenly dived for a tree and climbed rapidly into its branches. His motive, Augustine readily divined, was to elude a rough, hairy dog which was toiling at his wake. The dog reached the tree a moment after his quarry had climbed it and stood there barking. Augustine strolled up. Having a little trouble with the dumb friend, Bish? The bishop peered down from his airy. <laughs> Young man, said he, save me. Right, most indubitably ho, replied Augustine. Leave it to me. Until today, he had always been terrified of dogs, but now he did not hesitate. Almost quicker than words can tell, he picked up a stone, discharged it at the animal, and whooped cheerily as it got home with a thud. The dog, knowing when he had had enough, removed himself at some 45 mph. And the bishop, dis descending cautiously, clasped Augustine's hand in his. My preserver, said the bishop, don't give it another thought. Always glad to do a pal a good turn. We clergymen must stick together. I thought he had me there for a minute. Quite a nasty customer, full of rude energy. <laughs> his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Deuteronomy 34, 7. <laughs> I wonder if you can direct me to the vicarage. I fear I have come a little out of my way. I'll take you there. Thank you. Perhaps it would be as well if you did not come in. I have a serious matter to discuss with old Pipes, um, I mean with Reverend Stanley Brandon. I have a serious matter to discuss with his daughter. <laughs> I'll just hang about the garden. You are a very excellent young man, said the bishop as they walked along. You a curate, eh? At present, but, said Augustine, tapping his companion on the chest. <laughs> Just watch my smoke. That's all I ask you to do. Just watch my smoke. I will. You should rise to great heights, to the very top of the tree. Like you did just now, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you young rogue. He poked Augustine in the ribs. <laughs> Said Augustine. He slapped the bishop on the back. But all joking aside, said the bishop as he entered the vicarage grounds, I really shall keep my eye on you and see that you receive the swift preferment with which your talents and character deserve. I say to you, my dear friend, speaking seriously and weighing my words, that the way you picked that dog off with that stone was the smoothest thing I ever saw. And I am a man who always tells the strict truth. Great is truth, and mighty above all things. Esdras 4, 41. <laughs> Said Augustine. He turned away and strolled toward the laurel bushes, his customary meeting place with Jane. The bishop went on to the front door and rang the bell. Although he had made no definite appointment, Augustine was surprised when the minutes passed and no Jane appeared. 
He did not know that she had been told by her father to entertain the bishop's wife that morning and show her the sights of the lower brisket in the midden. He waited some quarter of an hour with growing impatience and was about to leave when suddenly from the house there came to his ears the sound of voices raised angrily. He stopped. The voices appeared to proceed from a room on the ground floor facing the garden. Running lightly over the turf, Augustine paused outside the window and listened. The window was open at the bottom and he could hear quite distinctly. The vicar was speaking in a voice that vibrated through the room. <laughs> well, is that so? Said the vicar. It is. Said the bishop. Ha ha! Said the vicar. Ha ha to you and to see how you like it. Augustine drew up a step closer. It was plain that Jane's fears had been justified and that there was serious trouble afoot between these two old schoolfellows. He peeped in. The vicar, his hands behind his coattails, was striding up and down the carpet, while the bishop, his back to the fireplace, glared defiance at him from the hearth rug. Who ever told you you were an authority on chastables? I don't believe you know what a chastable is. Is that so? Well, what is it then? It is a circular cloak hanging from the shoulders, elaborately embroidered with a pattern and with orphreys. And you can argue as much as you like, young pie face, but you can't get away from the fact that there are too many orphreys on yours. And what I'm telling you is that you jolly well got to switch off a few of those orphreys or you'll get it in the neck. <laughs> well, is that so? I just won't, so there! And it's like your cheek coming here and trying to hide at me. You seem to have forgotten that I knew you when you were a sneaky-faced kid at school and that if I liked, I could tell the world one or two things about you, which would probably amuse it. My past is an open book. Is it? The vicar laughed malevolently. Who put the white mouse in the French master's desk? The bishop started. Who put jam in the dormitory prefect's bed? He Who couldn't toilet. keep his collar clean? <laughs> Who used to wear a dicky? <laughs> <laughs> the bishop's wonderful organ-like voice whose softest whisper could be heard through a vast cathedral, rang out in tones of thunder. Who was sick at the house supper? The vicar quivered from head to foot. His rubicund face turned a deeper crimson. You know jolly well that there was something wrong with the turkey. Might have upset anyone. The only thing wrong with the turkey was that you ate too much of it. If you had paid as much attention to developing your soul as you did to developing your tummy, you might by now, said the bishop, have risen to my own eminence. Oh, my time. No, perhaps I am wrong. You never had the brain. The vicar uttered another discordant laugh. Brain is good. We all know about your eminence, as you call it, and how you rose to that eminence. What do you mean? You are a bishop. How you became one, we will not inquire. What do you mean? What I say, we will not inquire. <laughs> hmm. The bishop's self-control left him. His face contorted with fury. He took a step forward, and simultaneously, Augustine sprang lightly into the room. Now, 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 said Augustine. <laughs> now, 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 now. <laughs> the two men stood transfixed. They stared at the intruder dumbly. Come, come, said Augustine. The vicar was the first to recover. He glowered at Augustine. What 
do you mean by jumping through my window? Are you a curate or a harlequin? Augustine met his gaze with an unfaltering eye. I am a curate. He replied with a dignity that well became him. And as a curate, I cannot stand by and see two superiors of the cloth, who are moreover old school fellows, forgetting themselves. It isn't right. Well, he started it. <laughs> Placing a hand on the shoulder of each, Augustine proceeded. I hate to see you two dear good chaps quarreling like this. Never mind who started it. Augustine silenced the bishop with a curt gesture as he made to speak. Be sensible, my dear fellows. Respect the decencies of debate. Exercise a little good-humored give and take. You say, he went on, turning to the bishop, that our good friend here has too many orphreys on his chasuble. I do, and I stick to it. Yes, 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 but what, said Augustine soothingly, <laughs> are a few orphreys between friends. Reflect, you and our worthy vicar here were at school together. You are bound by the sacred ties of the old alma mater. With him, you sported on the green, with him, you shared a crib and threw inked darts in the hour supposed to be devoted to the study of French. Do these things mean nothing to you? Do these memories touch no chord? He turned appealingly from one to the other. The vicar had moved away and was wiping his eyes. The bishop fumbled for a pocket handkerchief. There was a silence. Shouldn't have spoken as I did, Bacco, mumbled the vicar. Pie face, <laughs> said the bishop in a choking voice. <laughs> if you want to know what I think, you are right in attributing your indisposition at the house supper to something wrong with your turkey. I recollect saying at the time that the bird should never have been served in such a condition. <laughs> and when you put that white mouse in the French master's desk, said the vicar, you performed one of the noblest services to humanity of which there is any record. They ought to have made you a bishop on the spot. My <laughs> face. Oh, Bacco. The two men clasped hands. Splendid, said Augustine. Everything hotsy-totsy now? <laughs> quite, quite. As far as I'm concerned, completely hotsy-totsy, <laughs> said the bishop. He turned to his old friend solicitously. You will continue to wear all the offerings you want, will you not, pie face? No, no, I see now that I was wrong. From now on, Baco, I can take them or leave them. But pie face, it's all right. I can take them and leave them alone. I abandon Orphreys altogether. Splendid fellow. The bishop coughed to hide his emotion, and there was another silence. I think perhaps, he went on after a pause, I could be leaving you now my dear chap, and going in search of my wife. She's with your daughter, I believe, somewhere in the village. They're coming up the drive now. Ah, I see them. A charming girl, your daughter. Augustine clasped him on the shoulder. Bish, said a mouthful. She is the dearest, sweetest girl in the whole world. And I should be glad, Vicar, if you would give your consent to our immediate union. I love Jane with a good man's fervor, and I am happy to inform you that my sentiments are returned. Assure us, therefore, of your approval, and I will go at once and have the bands put up. The vicar leaped as though he had been stung. Like so many vicars, he had a poor opinion of curates, and he had always regarded Augustine as rather below than above the general norm or level of the despised class. What? <laughs> a most excellent idea, said the bishop beaming. A happy notion, I call it. My daughter? 
the vicar seemed dazed. <laughs> My daughter marry a curate? You were a curate once yourself, pie face. Yes, but not a curate like that. No? You were not, nor was I. Better for us both had we been. This young man, I would have you know, is the most outstandingly excellent young man I have ever encountered. <laughs> Are you aware that scarcely an hour ago, he saved me with the most consummate address from a large shaggy dog with black spots and a kink in his tail? <laughs> I was sorely pressed, pie face. When this young man came up, and with a readiness of resource and an accuracy of aim, which it would be impossible to overpraise, got that dog in the short rib with a rock and sent him flying. The vicar seemed to be struggling with some powerful emotion. His eyes had widened. A dog with black spots? Very black spots but no blacker, I fear, than the heart they hid. And they really plugged him in the short ribs. As far as I could see, squarely in the short ribs. The vicar held out his hand. Mulliner, he said, I was not aware of this. In light of the facts which have just been drawn to my attention, I have no hesitation in saying that my objections are removed. I have had it in for that dog since the second Sunday before Sector Jessima, when he pinned me by the ankle as I paced beside the river composing a sermon on certain alarming manifestations of the so-called modern spirit. <laughs> Take Jane. I give my consent freely. And may she be as happy as any girl with such a husband ought to be. A few more affecting words were exchanged, and then the bishop and Augustine left the house. The bishop was silent and thoughtful. I owe you a great deal, Mulliner. Oh, I don't know, said Augustine. Would you say that? <laughs> a very great deal. You saved me from a terrible disaster. Had you not leaped through that window at that precise juncture and intervened, I really believe I should have pasted my dear old friend Brandon in the eye. I was sorely exasperated. Our good vicar can be trying at times. My fist was already clenched and I was just about hauling off for the swing when you checked me. What the result would have been had you not exhibited a tact and discretion beyond your years, I do not like to think I might have been on frocks. He shivered at the thought. I could never have shown my face as the Athenium again, but, tut tut, went on the bishop, patting Augustine on the shoulder. Let us not dwell on what might have been. Speak to me of yourself. The vicar's charming daughter. You really love her. I do indeed. The bishop's face had grown grave. Think well, Mulliner. Marriage is a serious affair. Do not plunge into it without due reflection. I myself am a husband. And though singularly blessed, in the possession of a devoted helpmeet, cannot but feel sometimes that a man is better off as a bachelor. Women, Mulliner, are odd. <laughs> True, said Augustine. <laughs> My own dear wife is the best of women. And as I never weary of saying, a good woman is a wonderful creature. Cleave into the right and the good under all change. Lovely in youthful comeliness, lovely all her life in comeliness of art. And yet, 
And yet, yes. said Augustine, the bishop mused for a moment. He wriggled a little with an expression of pain and scratched himself between the shoulder blades. Well, I'll tell you. It is a warm and pleasant day today, is it not? Exceptionally, Clement. A fair, sunny day made gracious by a temperate westerly breeze. And yet, Mulliner, if you will credit my statement, my wife insisted on my putting on my thick winter woolies <laughs> this morning, <laughs> truly, sighed the bishop. <laughs> As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, <laughs> so, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. <laughs> Proverbs 11, 21. 22, corrected Augustine. I should have said 22. <laughs> they are made of fit flannel, and I have exceptionally sensitive skin. <laughs> Oblige me, my dear fellow, by rubbing me in the small of the back with the ferrule of your stick. <laughs> I think it will ease my irritation. But my poor dear old bitch, this must not be. The bishop shook his head ruefully. You would not speak so heartily, Mulliner, if you knew my wife. There is no appeal from her decrees. Nonsense! cried Augustine cheerily. Oh, he looked through the trees to where the lady bishop is escorted by Jane was examining a lobelia through her yeah. lorgnette. <laughs> With just the right bend of cordiality and condescension. I'll fix that for you in a second. The bishop clutched his arm. My boy, what are you going to do? I'm just going to have a word with your wife mm. and put the matter up to her as a reasonable woman. Mm. Thick winter woolies on a day like this. Absurd, preposterous. <laughs> I never heard such rot. <laughs> the bishop gazed after him with a leaden heart. Already he had come to love this young man like a son, and to see him charging so lightheartedly into the very jaws of destruction <laughs> afflicted him with a deep and poignant sadness. He knew what his wife was like when even the highest in the land attempted to thwart her. And this brave young lad was but a curate. In another moment, she would be looking at him through her lorgnette, and England was littered with the shriveled remains of curates <laughs> at whom the Lady Bishopess had looked through her lorgnette. <laughs> he had seen them wilt like salted slugs <laughs> at the Episcopal breakfast table. He held his breath. Augustine had reached the Lady Bishopess and the Lady Bishopess was even now raising her lorgnette. <laughs> the bishop shut his eyes and turned away. And then, years afterward, it seemed, a cheery voice hailed him, and turning, he perceived Augustine bounding back through the trees. <laughs> it's all right, Bish, said Augustine. All, all right, faltered the bishop. Yes. She says you can go and change into the thin cashmere. The bishop, <laughs> the bishop reeled. But, but, but what did you say to her? What arguments did you employ? Oh, I just pointed out what a warm day it was and jollied her along a bit. Jollied her along a bit? <laughs> 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 In the most friendly and cordial manner, she has asked me to call at the palace one of these days. The bishop seized Augustine's hand. My boy, he said in a broken voice, you shall do more than call at the palace. You shall come and live at the palace. <laughs> Become my secretary, shall I tell you that, my boy? <laughs> Mulliner, and name your own salary. If you intend to marry, you will require to shave that mustache.
become my secretary and never leave my side. I have needed somebody like you for years. It was late in the afternoon when Augustine returned to his rooms, for he had been invited to lunch at the vicarage and had been the life and soul of the cheery little party. A letter for you, sir, said Mrs. Wardle uh, obsequiously. Augustine took the letter. I am sorry to say I shall be leaving you shortly, Mrs. Wardle. Sir, is there anything I can do? Oh, it's not that. The fact is, the bishop has made me his secretary, and I shall have to shift my toothbrush and spats to the palace, you see. Well, fancy that, sir. Why, you'll be a bishop yourself one of these days. Possibly, <laughs> said Augustine. Possibly. And now let me read this. He opened the letter. A thoughtful frown appeared on his face as he read, My dear Augustine, I am writing in some haste to tell you that the impulsiveness of your aunt has led to a rather serious mistake. She tells me that she dispatched to you yesterday a parcel post, a sample bottle of my new Buck You Uppo, which she obtained without my knowledge from my laboratory. Had she mentioned that she was intending to do so, I could have prevented a very unfortunate <coughs> occurrence. Mulliner's bucky Wuppo is of two grades of qualities, the A and the B. The A is a mild and strengthening tonic designed for human invalids. The B, on the other hand, is purely for circulation in the animal kingdom and was invented to fill a long felt want throughout our Indian possessions. As you are doubtless aware, the favorite pastime of the Indian Maharajas is the hunting of the tiger of the jungle from the backs of elephants. And it has happened frequently in the past that hunts have been spoiled by the failure of the elephant to see eye to eye with its owner in the matter of what constitutes sport. Too often, elephants on sighting the tiger have turned and galloped home. And it was to correct this tendency on their part that I invented Mulliner's Buck You Uppo B. One teaspoonful of the Buck You Uppo B administered in its morning bran mash will cause the most timid elephant to trumpet loudly and charge the fiercest tiger without a qualm. Abstain, therefore, from taking any of the contents of the bottle you now possess. And believe me, your affectionate uncle, Williford Molliner. Augustine remained for some time in deep thought after perusing this communication. Then rising, he whistled a few bars of the psalm appointed for the 26th of June and left the room. Half an hour later, a telegraphic message was speeding over the wires. It ran as follows. Wilfred Molliner, The Gables. Lesser Slossingham Salop. Letter received. Send immediately. C O D. Three cases of the bee. <laughs> Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Deuteronomy 28 5. <laughs> Augustine. 